Like many other artists, I was brainwashed into thinking that the rule of thirds was an acceptable method of composing an image. I guess that really depends on the standard of art you like to produce. Art at the master level like Da Vinci, Bougereau, Degas, Rubens, or art like a Sunday painter whose goal is to hang their painting in the local antique store, not the prestigious gallery or museum. Without composition, art cannot flourish. And when using the rule of thirds to guide your composition, you'll end up in a dark alley waiting to be maliciously fondled by mediocre art. This might sound harsh. Well, it kind of is. We need to make a stand and stop believing all the myths out there about this flawed and lazy tool for composition. We need to get back the integrity in our art. I'm hoping that busting the myths floating around on the internet about the rule of thirds, that I can open your eyes to powerful techniques that have been used by master painters for centuries. It's my experience that people don't like rules, and they certainly don't like to follow them. They're always saying the same cliche phrase, well, rules were meant to be broken, or I think it's good to learn the rules, but then know when to break them. The word rule has a meaning that can be looked upon as negative. What I'm striving to demonstrate in this video and throughout my blog isn't a rule that needs to be broken. It's a canon of knowledge that you can choose to incorporate into your art if you wish. Your choice, it's simple as that. Ignorance is bliss, they say, but I never found it blissful to be frustrated trying to make sense of composition when the rule of thirds was guiding me. The rule of thirds needs to die a slow and painful death for all the damage it's done to the art world. With that being said, let's start with our first myth. It makes it visually pleasing. To debunk this, we have to know what makes an image visually pleasing, and I assure you, it's not plotting your subject on the rule of thirds crosshair. To be visually pleasing is to apply your composition techniques in a way which is clearly read by the viewer without getting caught up on distracting elements or creating confusion by lack of hierarchy. How do we do that? Well, we need to understand how the mind perceives visual stimuli. For this, we use gestalt psychology techniques like figure ground relationship to clearly separate the subject from the background, or the law of continuity which will allow us to create a sweeping arabesque by using multiple objects. We can even use the greatest area of contrast to help direct our viewer's eyes towards the main subject. The next myth we have is pros use it. Annie Leibovitz is definitely a pro and one of the most inspirational photographers of today. So let's grab one of her photos and simply line it up to the rule of thirds grid. Then we'll see if she used it or not. Here we have a group photo which I covered extensively in the Canon of Design blog. We can see how the mantle lines up perfectly to the rule of thirds grid. Hmm, I guess she did use it. But wait, how did she pose the models? How did she create such a great composition when there are only horizontals and verticals to guide us? What do I do next? I have some of the models on the rule of thirds, but where do I go now? How do I position their arms, their legs, the dress, and their gaze? This is where we introduce dynamic symmetry. In order for Annie to properly pose the models, she uses dynamic symmetry. That's basically a fancy term for a grid system. To put it simply, it's something we can use in our photography to help us organize our composition. We can use the diagonals, verticals, and horizontals to help create a rhythm and unity throughout the image. Whether it's a painting, photo, or sculpture, dynamic symmetry can be used for all of them. We could get really involved into explaining the system more, but let's not lose focus on the main purpose, which is to expose the rule of thirds for what it is. A watered down rule that has brainwashed us all into thinking it's worth sharing with the world. It moves the eye around the image. This couldn't be further from the truth. Plotting your subject on a point without consideration for the whole will not help create movement within your composition. When we learn of another gestalt psychology technique called the law of continuity, we'll discover several tools we can use to create movement and unity which will move the eye around the image. The most visually pleasing one is the arabesque. This is a curvilinear element you can incorporate into your art to create a beautiful sweeping movement throughout the image. Master painters used arabesques extensively throughout their work. Another technique used to create movement is called a coincidence. This is edge-to-edge -edge relationships which unify multiple elements and can create movement side to side and up and down. It's not a solid line as you might think when you hear the term leading lines. It's not that at all. It's broken, hidden, 
It's a magic trick which we can use to hide our design and allow the mind to easily close the gaps. In this photo, we can see the edge-to-edge -edge relationships Annie Leibovitz creates by using the limbs of the models. We can also see it in this painting of the Mona Lisa by da Vinci and in this complex composition by Bougereau. Number four, it gets the subject out of the center. First off, whoever said the center was so bad? Why are we led to believe this? There's a gestalt psychology technique called the law of symmetry, which basically means the human mind is always trying to find balance in visual stimuli. So if we use the rule of thirds and place the subject off center, then we will need a counterpart to help us balance the image. If there's no counterpart, then we've just created a horrible balance within our composition. There is vertical balance, which I call breathing room, and there is horizontal balance, which I call gazing direction. And we must understand how to control each of these in order to create a properly balanced composition. Here's a photo I created which has the main subject centered, but is properly balanced because I considered breathing room and gazing direction. It took me years to erase the damage the rule of thirds caused on my compositions. I was always placing the subject on one side or the other without consideration of the image as a whole. Number five, it's the basis for a well-balanced and interesting shot. We already covered the law of symmetry which covers the proper balance of an image. But what we didn't mention is how the rule of thirds gives birth to unwanted negative space. If we are generically placing our subject into one of the crosshairs without consideration of the whole, then we won't have a counterpart on the other side of the composition. In result, we'll have negative space that takes attention away from our subject. Negative space can be properly used to create a feeling of isolation or loneliness, but to use it without sophistication is a total rookie move. Which brings us to number six. It's a great starting point for beginners. Now, in my own experience, the rule of thirds only led me down a dead end road. I thought of it as revolutionary at first, and I was boasting its powers to photographers who were just starting out. Later, I found myself at a plateau and not able to understand how to properly compose an image because the rule of thirds was guiding me. If new artists start with a grid of dynamic symmetry instead of the rule of thirds, they'll be able to later take advantage of the diagonals which they can create rhythm with, you know, by posing the model or applying paint strokes. The available diagonals within the rectangle will limit the number of directions you use. This is called gamut, which will create a more powerful composition rather than your art looking like the spokes of a bicycle tire. All right, number seven. Artists from the Renaissance, or Greek artists, created the Rule of Thirds. The Rule of Thirds was first documented by John Thomas Smith around 1797, and if you take a look at his paintings, you'll see that he wasn't a master at all. Da Vinci would be rolling in his grave if you heard anybody saying he was using this rule. The amount of schooling, studying, and practice he put into his compositions, and someone's gonna water it down to something as simple as the Rule of Thirds? No way. Him, along with other masters, Greek included, used dynamic symmetry, the golden section, and other design techniques like arabesque, gamut, coincidences, radiating lines, figure-to-ground relationship, ellipses, and enclosures. Not the rule of thirds. Number eight, the human eye naturally gravitates to the intersection points. You know, I truly wish composition were this easy. Place your subject in a crosshair and bam, you're automatically controlling the viewer's eyes. Not so fast. What about the fact that we are drawn to areas of high contrast? When we make our subject the greatest area of contrast, won't we look there first, no matter what position they're in? Another thing that pulls our eyes is something I call edge flicker. It refers to high contrasting elements near the edge which greatly distract the viewer from our subject. Creating a hierarchy of contrast and keeping the edges free of distractions will help you control the way your viewer's eyes move around the composition. Number nine, cropping to the rule of thirds after shooting a photo is a great way to save an image. Well, cropping a poorly composed, badly lit image will not save anything. That's starting at the end and working backwards. Learn composition and gestalt psychology techniques so you know what to look for how to solve visual problems, and get it right in camera. Don't sacrifice precious pixels for the rule of thirds. Your creativity deserves better than that. Number 10. The power points, or golden points, create tension. Placing your subject on a third is not going to create tension as we've learned so far. 
If we take a look at a gestalt psychology technique called the law of proximity, we'll see how visual tension can be created. Like this painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. They are clearly unified by their proximity, but another thing to notice is the visual tension created by the fact that they are almost touching, but not quite. It's the moment before impact. Or this photo where the man is almost within reach of his dying wife. It's that close proximity that creates the tension. When considering the law of proximity, distance can create negative space, which, in this photo, creates a tension in the room. So many tricks and techniques can be applied to create a remarkable composition which communicates clearly to your viewer. I'm begging you, abandon the rule of thirds. Leave it behind and adopt the dynamic symmetry grid, which is just as simple to use, but can leave many more options open for you as your art progresses. If you found this information useful, please share it with your friends. Help me tackle this rule of thirds beast, kill it, and introduce better techniques to others who are in need of powerful composition. Learning powerful composition is the only path to becoming a master of your craft. If you are thirsty for more knowledge, please join the Master Pass membership or buy the book Canon of Design Mastering Artistic Composition, which is available on my site. Thank you so much for joining me today. I truly appreciate the support. Sign up for the newsletter so we can remain in contact, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.